Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today on the 11th of the first month on our Creator's calendar, which happens to line up with the 25th of March, 2023, on the Gregorian calendar. And we're currently doing a reading of the book of Hanok. We're, we're on chapter 72. However, a question came up this week about the uh, calendar. Specifically, there's a few different groups that are keeping what they call the Zadok calendar or the Enoch calendar or the Dead Sea Scrolls calendar, the Essene calendar. There's a few different names for it for whatever reasons. But um, the question came up about whether or not we're on the right track. How do you determine when the year starts? Because different people have some different ideas. I believe it was a, two years ago, we went over why not to intercalate, and that was a pretty long post and a, uh, just a, some information we put together for another brother, and then we've shared it for quite a while here, but that covers the book of Hanok, the book of Yobelim, what exactly is in the Dead Sea Scrolls that, that relates to the calendar as well as some definitions of words that are used, where we get them from, and then supplemental information from a variety of places like the Recognitions of Clement, the Apostolic Constitutions, and the Dead Sea Scrolls all collaborating that you do not intercalate. You don't add any days to the years in between them, and you don't add between, like, add to the year. It's 364 days only, and there's no there's no adding to or changing or switching weeks or doing anything like that. We'll we'll link that in the description of the video. And there's also a video that we did reading through that, and I'll link that as well for anyone that's interested. But that's not quite the topic for today. Specifically, we want to cover how do you determine what does scripture say about how to determine the beginning of the year okay so <clears throat> first we'll read through chapter 72 here because this is really the gist of it and scripture says to teach us to number our days so that sinners will turn back to you right i think that's one of the psalms by moshe in the psalms but um the sun is the great light that determines the day. This is, this is made plainly evident in the book of Yobelim, Genesis chapter 1, and then right here in Hanok chapter 72. It's clearly stated in the recognitions of Clement and the apostolic constitutions and things like that. But the idea, the sun determines when a day is and when the night begins by its coming and going or rising and setting respectively the seven times in a day that you shall praise them are all the changes of state of the light during a 24-hour period and then the uh, things that our mashiach walked out perpetually the third hour he was convicted that's also the third hour is when they did their morning offerings and then the sixth hour he was impaled and then the ninth hour, he gave up his ruach and, 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 and died. And so the third, sixth, the ninth hour are three times during the day where you acknowledge the truth and you praise him. The morning and evening offerings was at the third hour and the ninth hour, respectively. And that was perpetually done by the Kohanim or the sons of Louis. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, they also have morning and evening psalms and prayers, or you have the templates for presumably uh, an entire year's worth of prayers that they would do perpetually every day at those times. But <clears throat> back on track, right here in chapter 72, it should be established that there is only 364 days in a year. The sun, the great light is what determines when those days happen. And that the signs that are given in, in this luminary for the completion of a year 
all happen and then culminate like the the equal day and night is the day before the first day of the year and then you can see that at the end of the chapter so all of the change of seasons the four intercalary days or the the uh days where you have the signs are the 31st of their respective month real quick i'll, I'll show you a, a picture before we move on so just so everyone can see it this would be the calendar that is enumerated in the book of Hanok here in Yob Elim throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls. The red box right here is the Chodesh, the first of the first month, the first of the fourth month, the first of the seventh month, and the first of the tenth month. And these are the ones that are the Chodeshim or the Chodesh that you are supposed to celebrate. They're all Sabbaths. We know Yom Teruah is definitely and in the dead sea scrolls it talks about the first of the first month being a high shabbat and the, the offerings that are supposed to be given there and then you have i believe it's in yeshiyahu where it mentions from chodesh to chodesh and from sabbath to sabbath all flesh shall come and worship before me which is alluding to these four days it's made clear that it's only these four days and not every first day of every month because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Not only is it mentioned right in there specifically when those days are, but you have in the Psalms, there's extra Psalms and there's also an, an account of the writings of Dawid, just like you have in the common scriptures, the account of Shalomo's Proverbs and Psalms that he wrote and, and songs and whatnot. They have an account in the Dead Sea Scrolls that covered what Dawid had written. And he wrote one song for every day of the year, 364. He wrote a special song for every Sabbath sacrifice, all 52. And then he wrote a song for every feast day, specifically for the special days and for the, the new months or the Chodesh. And there's only four of those that have a special song, meaning it was only the change the heads of the seasons that counted. But there is 91 days in each season, and that 31st day of the 3rd, 6th, ninth, and 12th month, respectively, is the day that you have the sign that appears on it. So the first one throughout the year would be the longest day of the year on the last day of spring. Then you'd have equal day and night and the 6th month and 31st of it. That would go into the first day of fall where you start losing time each day and gaining it each night until the 31st, which is the shortest day of the year, the longest night of the year. And that would be the 31st of the ninth month. And then the next day would be the first day of winter. 91 days, you have equal day and night again. And then the next day would be the beginning of the year. 364 days only, and you don't add to it. You don't, it, it specifically says in Hanok, you do not add between the years and you do not add year to year. So you don't add a day here or there and you don't add a week ever. That theme of not intercalating, again, that was already covered, but it, there's multiple sections, multiple cycles that go. You have this one cycle and then another cycle that you also use to determine whether or not you're on the right track is the lunar cycle. It's a third witness to when the calendar starts that we'll get to, but pretty much it's a full moon on the first of the year, every third year. So when creation happened, there was a full moon at creation on the fourth day of the week. And then the next year, because there's only 354 day cycle with the lunar period, it would be 10 days too soon. So you'd have 10 days off on the 22nd, sorry, the 22nd of the 12th month would be the full moon. And then the next year, it would be the 12th of the 12th month. And then the next year, it would be the second, which is 30 days from the first there. So that would be the, the second Adar that they have. And then you'd have a full moon again on the first of the month for that. So every third year, it'd be full moon, 10 days too soon. 20 days too soon and then full moon again with that third year and that's a cycle that continually repeats itself we've been tracking it jerry morris has started tracking it since 2013 and we've followed it 
every year since then. You had 2013, 2016, 2019, and now um, 2020, 2022 was the last one where you had the full moon. And then this last year that we just had, the full moon was on the 22nd of the 12th month. So you can follow these things. It, it's not what you're going to see written on the internet. It's going to be off by two days sometimes, or it'd be spot on depending. But if you observe it, you'll see that it is out there, that it is full, or that it is in the condition it's supposed to be at those times. I believe our brother in England. Would you a moment, Richard, and explain why it would be important for this calendar uh the the uh, universal acceptance of something like this why did father give it to us well it's at the mouth of two or three witnesses every matter is established so while the sun is the great light that records when the day begins and ends in every day of the year and when the feast days are and all those things which is exactly what it says in yobelim and it, we're going to read what it says in hanok here to prove that as well but that's only one witness then you have what we're going to look at, the manifestation of the signs during each season. So at every season of the year, you have different things that will be manifest in creation. It's enumerated in the book of Hanok, partly. And then it's in the Dead Sea Scrolls and elsewhere where you can piece together the other ones. But when you look at the signs of each season, you'll see it manifest from that first day on in full. You'll see a little telltale signs of things happening about a week or so beforehand almost every time but it's not until the first of each season that you actually see those things manifesting throughout that that 30 or that 91 day period and then the conjunction of the lunar cycle with that is a third witness that proves that you're on the right track there's no looking around for anything else or you don't have to try to contrive something of your own mind it's literally just seeing what it is and the important thing is so that everyone can one mind, one opinion, one shoulder, doing doing his will kind of thing. Literally, everyone's on the same page. Right. And the like right now, you have multiple different groups all wanting to follow what they call the, the Dead Sea Scrolls calendar or the Zadok calendar, like we said. And they have different days, like there's one that's a week before us, and there's a one that's a week after us, and there's even a lady that has a roving Shabbat. And she, you, they all use sundials to help determine when that is, but you won't find it anywhere written, not a single place in any part of scripture where it tells you to look at a sundial to determine the year or how to do that. And that's the only contention. It's no different than looking for the moon. You don't have those instructions written, but you do have it actually uh, spoken against in a few places about that. So... I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes or we're not wanting to hurt anybody's feelings with their opinions or anything like that. And if you do have information on how it mentions anywhere to use a sundial and how to do that, please do share. I don't mind. We, we all want to learn, but I've never found that written. I have never talked to anyone that has. And the only things that I do know that are written is what we're going to cover today. Well, Which is counting 364 days. That simple. Yes, he says, teach us to number our days. And that's pretty much what you do. He gives you exactly what it is you're looking for and how long it's supposed to be. And he gave it to his children to keep. It was given to the Kohanim specifically, which again, I, it was pretty exhaustive. I did, we, we put a lot into that why not to intercalate. It covers pretty much, if you read through the whole thing or watch the video, it covers every nook and cranny about who is to be trusted what they were supposed to be teaching and what they actually shared so the sons of zadok were foretold to be keeping the truth while all the other children turned away in the time of his wrath and they're the ones that you're supposed to listen to we have that from the times of yehezkiel or ezekiel all the way through to the apostolic constitutions mentioned in that video and on that on that post so I recommend if you really want to get in depth on that to to check that out. But <clears throat> like I said, this is specific on how to determine when the year starts. 
all right a brother just asked a question who are the sons of zadok and that that's a twofold question i'll give it to you real quick the sons of zadok were literally his children zadok was the kohen with abiathar during the the reign of the end of the reign of Dawid in the beginning or throughout the reign of Shalomo and it was mentioned in Yehezkiel that it was the sons of Zadok who during the reign of Dawid in I believe it's in Chronicles you get the list of the Kohanim who were excuse me who were in service at that time and it lists one through 24 of the sons of Zadok and Ithamar, if I remember correctly. And who was of those sons that were going to serve in a rotation throughout the year. It, it does not, however, give you who started the order or when. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have more information about who was the first to actually do that in the cycle that it goes through. And the, the Kohen rotation just so everyone's familiar, is the longest secular, uh, cycl uh, cycle of all of the calendar calculations, the algorithm, if you will, that makes it all fit together. You have the yearly cycle of the sun. You have the three-year cycle of the moon. You have the Shemitah cycle, the, the land Sabbath every seventh year, the Yobel cycle every 50th year, all the way up to the the Kohen cycle, where it started with Gamal, number 22 of the order, and it goes through a 294-year cycle until it starts over with Gamal again and repeats that forever. They, I've mentioned this before, but I'll do it again because I, I, anyone who's interested, you'll find this stuff amazing. If you just look up the meanings of their names, the the list of the 24 Kohanim that we're serving, and then you go all the way, you can go to the beginning of creation, in particular, if you look at the book of Yobelim, and you take the dates that things happened all the way through from the beginning of creation, all the way through to the Exodus, or even into later times, if you can get the day, the month, and the the, the year that it happened, you can backtrack to find out theoretically what Kohen would have been serving at that time and yes it, it foretells literally if you look at like when the exodus happened it lines up with uh, the name of the Kohen that's serving at that time foretells the events that are going on and you can do that with every one of them there is a brother named Scott Whitman who was a friend of Jerry Morris before brother Morris passed away and he had a few videos on the topic where he covered in particular the, the Exodus. And he covered, um, it might have been him or it might have been Brother Morris, but they covered our Mashiach's passion when he was born. If it was the 80th Yobel and what one that could have been in the name of the, the Kohen when it happened. But um, they go into detail and you can see over and over again how their name was foretelling the events that are happening. So it's it's... It's another witness to the truth of these things. But the point is, you have a yearly cycle all the way up to a 294-year cycle where these things have to repeat without fail, without adding any days. There's no intercalation. So at the very least, if you wanted to do an intercalary day, if there was anything that was ever written, it would have to be after an almost 300-year period before you can do that. And there's no there's no actual evidence that, that was ever done a lot of people <clears throat> think that it has to be done because we've been conditioned to believe that well there's 365.25 days in a year everybody knows that and you know that's just what we're taught however there's there's a lot of evidence that that's not true I'll, I've mentioned it before. Our brother Jerry Morris also talked about it. If you watch some of his older videos, his mother was a farmer on the land. He was a farmer, and he remembers talking to her back when she was a child. They would harvest in like two months before they do now on the Gregorian calendar. And it's changed as time went on because the seasons are shifting on that calendar. 
when I was born in 1982 in the high desert of California, it was winter time in April and, and May. There was still snow. It was snowing on the ground in May in the 80s in California. You think about it snowing in May today, it's ludicrous, right? It's way too hot for that kind of thing. But during the 80s in, in April, it was winter time in, re, in reality. So that was completely possible. There, there's other evidences for that as well, but that's not the point right now. Uh, a lot of people think that the, the sun tells the day, the moon tells the month or the season, and that is kind of true, but not exactly. The moon is for a diversity of seasons. In itself, it does not have any power to tell time or any authority of its own, just like our Mashiach came preaching the kingdom and empowering his children, the, the, the children of light, the stars, to run the course up before them. He, they have no inherent power of their own, but it's through him that they're empowered. It's the same way the sun empowers the luminaries that, that nourish the world. And what the, what the moon is supposed to do is for diversity of seasons and the nourishment of all that live. I don't know if you're all are familiar with the growing cycles and how you plant some things during a new moon, some things during a full moon or at different phases of the moon to have it benefit. But that's a literal thing in creation because that's what it represents for the kingdom, if you will. <clears throat> but long story short, diversity of seasons is what it mentions in Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls and things like that. The moon if you didn't have the fluctuation of the moon during the seasons or how it works out, then you would always have like the first day of the year would always have the same amount of sunlight and would always have the same temperatures and all the same features unless you're under your creator's judgment or favor, depending, right? But with the moon, the moon is its own, it's, it has its own light and it's cold. If you do a temperature of a shadow at night, it's warmer than the direct moonlight. And that's opposite of the sun, where it's warmth and then cooler in the shade. So it gives you that diversity, whether the moon is out during the day or night or whatever it is in whatever season, it fluctuates, it gives you diversity in that season, which is what the point of it is. And that's what it actually mentions in scripture. In the, set, in the Masoretic text, it says the moon is for appointed times, the Moedim. But that's one witness that is different than what you can find in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Septuagint, which mentions it's the, for the diversity of the seasons. Okay, <clears throat> so real quick, we already covered what this is going to do. We're just going to read through it and then, ob willing you'll see that the signs happen at the ends of each period, and then the Chodesh is what changes the season. But the whole point is the, the equal day and night, what they call the equinoxes, they don't happen on the first of the year, but they happen on the 31st, the day beforehand. And then the next day is the beginning of the year. Okay? So it says right here, chapter 72. The book of the courses of the luminaries of the Shamayim, the relations of each according to their classes, their dominion and their seasons according to their names and places of origin, and according to their months, which Oriel, the light of El, the Kodesh messenger who was with me, who is their guide, showed me. And he showed me all their laws exactly as they are, and how it is with regard to all the years of the world and unto eternity, till the new creation is accomplished which endures till eternity. That new creation is also mentioned in Yobelim, in Yeshiyahu. See, I'm creating something new, right? A man or a woman encompasses a man, the birth of our Mashiach. And the new creation is alluded to in other places as well. But for everyone that doesn't know, or if you're not quite familiar, you have the 7,000 year period from creation till the millennial reign, which was foretold in the creation account 
in his passion, in the 22 letters of the Aleph Bet and what was made during each day. It all foretells his works in history until the millennial reign. After the millennial reign, Satan's going to be released for a time, and he's going to have a chance to have anyone that will follow him again turn to him, and they're going to surround the land and try to destroy the people. And when that happens, just like the time of uh, Yehez Kial, who's surrounded by the Assyrian army, or just like the children in Mitzrayim, afflicted by the Mitzrayites, they're going to go through and it's going to be devastated. First, it was the, the cloud of, that went and killed the firstborn, right, in Mitzrayim. Then you had the 185,000 leaders or army of the Assyrians wiped out by the messenger. And at that time, you're going to have the elements melting, everything destroyed, Shemaim, the firmament, the earth, everything laid waste by fire. And after that, you'll have the great white throne judgment, the general resurrection, the judgment of all the living for a week of years, and then the final habitation, the second death, if you will, where those that are going to be assigned to the lake of fire are put there, and death is going to be no more. Then there's going to be the new creation. The, the Shamayim from above will be visible to all. They'll make a new firmament or a new Shamayim and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's the new creation or the renewed creation where the sun will be no more, the, or the moon will be no more, and there will be no need for the sun for light because Yahuwah is the light and our Mashiach is the lamp. And they will literally enlighten all the world all the time. There will be no more night. So uh, just a little recap there. Verse 2. And this is the first law of the luminaries. The luminary, the sun, has its coming or rising in the eastern portals of the Shemaim, and its going or setting in the western portals of the Shemaim. And I saw six portals in which the sun rises, and six portals in which the sun sets, and the moon rises and sets in these portals. Excuse me. And the leaders of the stars, and those whom they lead, six in the east and six in the west, and all following each other in accurately corresponding order. Many are also many windows to the right and left of these portals. Now, just to explain... The sun and the moon, they both, you see them come from the, the west and they go in the east. It mentions in, the, in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 that comes from the west, goes toward the south, or comes from the east, which also is the word in Hebrew, kadem, kuf dalet meim. It means to bore through, to be first east or before. And before the light is here, it's in the east, that it, right? And that's where it comes from. All those are related to sunrise. And then it goes to the south. And then it swings around, or it goes to the west, and then north again before it goes east. If you, if you don't have a concept of creation correct, that can be very confusing. But if you realize north is the center of the world, and wherever you are, you're going to see the sun appear in the east first. It goes to the south and then back to the west, and then it'll keep going in its circuit to your north and then swinging it back around to the east. It's continual motion. Now, the many portals or windows on the right and left of those portals are when you look at night as you watch from evening or dusk to last light the stars don't appear just on the horizon like the moon and the sun do they'll pop up wherever they are those are the windows in which they appear okay it says and first there goes forth the great luminary named the sun in hebrew that word is shemesh which is it literally means servant or the 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 steadfast servant that studiously runs the course before him, right? That's the sun. 
But it says, and his circumference is like the circumference of the Shemaim, meaning a 364 degree circle or 360 degree circle, right? And he is quite filled with illuminating and heating fire. The chariot on which he ascends, the wind drives, and the sun goes down from the Shemaim and returns through the north in order to reach the east, and is so guided that he comes to the appropriate, literally, that portal, and shines in the face of the Shemaim. In this way, he rises in the first month in the great portal, which is the fourth of those six portals in the east. Which is the, the middle one. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, right? It starts at the fourth portal. And I'm willing, I'll have some pictures sometime. It would be easier for you to see this and get a concept in your mind what it's talking about. But basically, he's going to say that the sun rises and sets in the same portal, but the moon fluctuates. And that depends on what phase it is throughout the year. It changes where it goes through following the sun or contrary to it, but always to stay in its, um, in its declination. They say that every day or every 24-hour period, the moon will be in a... a declining pattern of 11 degrees from the sun right and as it's going through its phases it, as it's gaining light or losing illumination it'll change what portals it goes through to stay the proper distance away from the sun during that time it, it's pretty interesting but it's also how you can it's how you can tell how creation functions once you get it uh, firmly to grasp in your mind But it says, and in that fourth portal from which the sun rises in the first month are 12 window openings from which proceed a flame when they are opened in their season. It, pretty much the, uh, the sun goes through the 12 zodiac constellations, which they call the window openings that proceed with the flame there. There used to be more detail about it. There's other places that have little fragments here and there. And then you can see, uh, if you realize that everything is, is, is all creation sings to the esteem of Yahuwah, what the sun represents, where it's at, is what the 12 zodiac signs represent, all foretell things if, you only, if we could pay attention. The light of truth like the bridegroom is the sun. What zodiac constellation it's in represents what tribes empowered with the light, if you will of the 12 sons of Yaakov and of the 12 emissaries that went to the tribes in dispersion. So it's all parables and it all has significance, but that's not the point for right now. It's just something to think about. So it says, when the sun rises in the Shemaim, he comes forth through that fourth portal, 30 mornings in succession and sets accurately in the fourth portal in the west of the Shemaim. And during this period, the day becomes daily longer and the night nightly shorter to the 30th morning. So real quick. Right here, this would be equal day and night. And then from this day to this day, right, you have increase of daylight every single day, a, de a decrease of darkness every single day for all of these days up to the 91st, which is the longest day of the year. When you do the math, and I'm sorry if I don't have this right, this is just off the top of my head, but he has nine parts light and nine parts darkness, 18 parts total for day and night for a 24 hour period. And it goes through from six or from nine parts and nine parts. After this, it goes to 12 parts light and six parts darkness, right? So you actually gain three parts and lose three parts throughout the course of this time. And if you do the math and break it down, I, I think it's like a minute or two minutes and 33 seconds every day. So, or a minute and 33 seconds every morning and evening that's added on until you get to that place where you get one part and one part changed over every month. 
but I'd have to double check to know for certain. However, you guys, you can do the math too and figure it out. And if I'm wrong, you can feel free to correct me. Just trying to give you something to think about there. But it's literally how fun how creation functions. You should be able to see it, and it's something that you can test and repeat and demonstrate. <clears throat> and it says, and on that day, the day is longer than the night by a ninth part, and the day amounts to exactly or exactly to ten parts, and the night to eight parts. Meaning right here, from the first to the thirtieth you have one part that switches over. So on this day, it's nine parts night, nine parts darkness. And then by this day, you have a completion. So it's going to be 10 parts day and eight parts darkness. And then you have another 30. And then it'll say that there is 11 parts day or light and seven parts darkness or night. And then after this other 30 right here, you have the last part. And then this one is the longest day of the year. And that is the sign or the intercalary. It's what's added as the sign of the change of season that's going to happen the next day. That's what we're going to see throughout the, the writing here. But the key thing is this 31st day, this equal day in light, is the, the last day of the 12th month. Okay. So it says, yeah, and on that day, the day is longer than the night by a ninth part, and the day amounts to exactly 10 parts, or exactly two ten parts, and the night to eight parts. And the sun rises from that fourth portal and sets in the fourth portal and returns to the fifth portal of the east 30 mornings and rises from it and sets in the fifth portal. So after the beginning of the second month, it's switched over to the next portal and it's no longer in the fourth. We would know this as the, uh, you have the sun starts on the equator, right? Or they say the, the uh, what is that, Capricorn and the other one? I can't remember. But there's the two constellations that it goes between throughout the year. And it's making a concentric circle where it's getting tighter and tighter and higher and higher until it gets to the, longest day of the year and then as it's going back out it's going lower and lower as well as further south until the shortest day of the year all right it says and the sun rises from that fourth portal i already read that one sorry verse 12 and then the day becomes longer by two parts and amounts to 11 parts and the night becomes shorter and amounts to seven parts and that's after 30 days in the fifth portal, right? And it returns to the east and enters into the sixth portal and rises and sets in the sixth portal one in 30 mornings on account of its sign, meaning the 31st is the day of its sign, right? On that day, the day becomes longer than the night and the day becomes double the night. And the day becomes 12 parts, and the night is shortened and becomes six parts. And the sun mounts up to make the day shorter and the night longer. And the sun returns to the east and enters into the sixth portal and rises from it and sets 30 mornings. So this would be the beginning of fall, where it's now still it's in the sixth portal again, but it's heading back in its circle a little wider and wider each day until it is losing its light right and when 30 mornings are accomplished the day decreases by exactly one part and becomes 11 parts and the night seven and the sun goes forth from that sixth portal in the west and goes to the east and rises in the fifth portal for 30 mornings and sets in the west again in the fifth western portal. On that day, the day decreases by two parts and amounts to ten parts, and the night to eight parts. 
And the sun goes forth from that fifth portal and sets in the fifth portal of the west and rises in the fourth portal for one in thirty mornings on account of its sign and sets in the west. On that day, the day is equalized with the night and becomes of equal length. And the night amounts to nine parts and the day to nine parts. All right, so you see we went through, this was the longest day of the year. And then right here, starting in the sixth portal, 30 days, then you have the loss of one part. And then 30 days, the loss of two parts. And then 31 days, you have the equal day and night again, last day of the sixth month. Then the next day would be the beginning of fall and Yom Teruah. On that day, the day is equalized with the night and becomes of equal length, and the night amounts to nine parts and the day to nine parts. And the sun rises from that portal and sets in the west and returns to the east and rises 30 mornings in the third portal and sets in the west in the third portal. And on that day, the night becomes longer than the day, and night becomes longer than night, and day shorter than day till the thirtieth morning, and the night amounts exactly to ten parts, and the day to eight parts. And the sun rises from that third portal and sets in the third portal in the west, and returns to the east, and for thirty mornings rises in the second portal in the east, and in like manner sets in the second portal in the west of the Shemaim. And on that day, the night amounts to eleven parts, and the day to seven parts. And the sun rises on that day from the second portal, or from that second portal, and sets in the west in the second portal, and returns to the east into the first portal for thirty, or one, and thirty mornings. On account of its sign, and sets in the first portal in the west of the Shemaim. So it says, and on that day, the night becomes longer and amounts to double of the day, and the night amounts to exactly, or exactly to 12 parts, and the day to six. So just so we can see, then you had it's decreasing by one part for 30 days. So it would be, at the end of this, it would be um, 10 and 8 instead of, or it would be 11 and 8 instead of, or 11 and 7, My, I'm sorry, instead of 12 and 6, and then you had 30 days, and it would be 10 and 8, and then you have another 31 days, and right here, it's equal parts day and night again, or 9 parts and 9 parts, and then the next day, I had that backwards. Sorry, you're losing light. So this is going from equal day and night, and then you're backwards. So you have extra night by one part, which would be 10. And then you would have the eight parts day. At the end here, you'd have 11 parts darkness and seven parts day. And at the end here, with the shortest day of the year, you would have 12 parts night and six parts day. One of these as well, this particular day of the year, there's a full moon every third year. And it was a pretty interesting phenomenon. The first time I saw the full moon on the shortest day of the year, or it was possibly the night previous, but you could still see it when it was becoming sunrise and it literally started just dropping straight south from the sky. So it wouldn't be in, it wouldn't be up at daytime with the sunrise. It was, I'd never seen anything like it before, but I was paying attention. It was pretty neat. But long story short, this is the shortest day of the year. And then the next one is the first day of winter where we should have it going back up and you see the light returning. So it says verse 27. 
and the sun has transversed the divisions of his orbit and turns again on those divisions of his orbit and enters that portal 30 mornings and sets also in the west opposite to it. So it goes back through the first portal for 30 mornings, right? And sets in it for 30 evenings. And on that night, has the night decreased in length by a ninth part? And the night has become 11 parts in the day, seven parts. And the sun has returned and entered into the second portal in the east and returns on those his divisions of his orbit for 30 mornings rising and setting. And on that day, the night decreases in length and the night amounts to 10 parts and the day to eight. And on that day, the sun rises from that portal and sets in the west and returns to the east and rises in the third portal for one and 30 mornings on account of its sign and sets in the west of the Shamayim. On that day, the night decreases and amounts to nine parts and the day to nine parts and the night is equal to the day and the year is exactly as to its days, 364. So, from the first of the tenth month to the thirtieth, you have increasing light to where it's no longer 12 and, and 6, but it becomes 11 and 7. Then you have another 30 days, and the light is from 10 to 8. And then another 31, and it's 9 and 9, or equal day and night, on the last day of the year. And from the beginning of the year till then is exactly 364 days. And then it will repeat where you have the light gaining until the longest day of the year. So there is no separation for when, there's no day that the sun takes time off to stop increasing or, or decreasing or moving its illumination. You don't have that anywhere written that you intercalculate for that purpose. But this is the first great witness on how you number your days and how the year functions. 364 days only based off the sun, right? So it says, and the length of the day and the length of the night and the shortness of the day and of the night arise through the course of the sun these distinctions are made, or literally it says they are separated, meaning that the great light, the sun, is what determines the day when it, and the night and the seasons and what feast days there are and when they are. It's all separated by the great light. And this is also what you can see in, the in reality, our Mashiach came, and he was the one who was given all authority from the Father. Not partial authority, but from him came the preaching of the Malkuth Shemaim, or the kingdom of the Shemaim. From him came the earthly kingdoms and governments on the world, which is what the moon represents as well. And he also empowers the stars of the children of light that run the course set before him. Right? He breathes onto them and empowers them to do so. Josephus. Yahusuf, right? And um, I believe it might be in Hokma Shalomo. It might be in the recognitions of Clement and elsewhere, but specifically in the book of Yahusuf or Flavius Josephus, Antiquities of the Yahudim, and the Wars of the Yahudim, he talks about how the sun literally empowers the luminaries, the moon and the stars, and from that nourishes all that is beneath them. And that's exactly how our Mashiach functions in creation with his people. When you look at what these represent in parable form, it's literally foretelling the truth. That's the kind of thing you can see throughout scripture and in a variety of means all the time. But it also helps you confirm what is true and how things actually function. So let's finish reading this real quick. It says, so it comes that its course becomes daily longer and its course nightly shorter and this is the law and the course of the sun and his return as often as he returns 60 times and rises i.e 
the great luminary which is named the sun forever and ever. And that which rises is the great luminary, and is so named according to its appearance, according as Yahuwah commanded. And he rises, so he set, or as he rises, so he sets and decreases not, and rests not, but runs day and night, and his light is sevenfold brighter than that of the moon. But as regards size, they are both equal. All right, shalom everyone again. Sorry about that. This is a little segue, and I wanted to share with you, this is another thing that's written um, from Ecclesiastes or Kohelet, chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, okay? It goes right in line with Hanok chapter 72, verses 4 and 5, and I wanted to read that real quick. It says, For there goes out of the, the great light, whose name is Hashemish, or the sun, its roundness is like the roundness of the sky, and it is totally filled with light and heat. The chariot on which it ascends is driven by the blowing wind. The sun goes in the sky in the west and returns by the north in order to go to the east. It is guided so that it shall reach the eastern gate and shine in the face of the sky. And that is in conjunction, or that lines up with what we can read right here. This is from Ecclesiastes, or Kohelet, chapter 1. It says, The sun also comes, and the sun goes, and hurries back to the place where it arose, going to the south and turning round to the north, turning, turning, and on its rounds the winds return. Now, the winds are not just the physical wind that blows things, but also when you think of electromagnetism, that's a type of wind. It's a movement or a force outside of normal in creation, moved by the Ruach, if you will, right? But this is the Hebrew for that verse right here, and you can see that it has al zephin, subib, subib, so round and round, in its circle, right? Haruach, or the wind, and upon its circle, it, it dwells the ruach, right? Or returns the wind. Shav, which is like teshuva, or to repent, to turn, and then haruach, or ha ruach, right? The wind, or the spirit. And that word, ruach, right? Ruach. It means wind, breath, spirit. It, there is no distinction in, in the difference between them. The breath of our nostrils is the Ruach of Yahuwah, that our enlivening, our life, our breath is his spirit, if you will, or the Ruach, which is also the winds that blow. <clears throat> but if you look at that word Zephin, right here, Zephin. The same word that's right here, Zephin, okay? It means north, north wind. It's literally meaning the hidden or dark region. And that's where the sun hides or it becomes dark to us. When you get closer, I live in Washington State, so I'm pretty far north in, in America there. I'm not the farthest north, but when you get towards the uh, longest day of the year, throughout the night, you can watch the sun set and the light will still be traveling to the north where you'll have like a purplish colored sky and it won't be pitch black anymore because you can actually follow the path of the sun as it's still going north, but you can't actually see continual daylight. The further north you go, places in Alaska and other places like Norway and whatnot, you'll actually have continual daylight where you'll watch the, the sun going in a circle over your head. And that's what this video right here, it was by a gentleman. His YouTube channel was called Thrive, Mr. Thrive and Survive. I don't know if it's up anymore. This video was, I think it was pulled down for a, a while ago. And there's other ones that they had made that were fantastic, but they were removed. Long story short, this, uh, this was a, showing the midnight sun, as they call it, in Alaska. 
where someone spent, I believe is almost a three day period, just having a, a camera spin in a circle and follow the, the sun as it continually went in a circle around you. And the missing zigzag absolutely proves the geocentric earth is the, the name of the video. And he goes into detail about how, because it's spinning in a circle, it proves that it's not, um, it's not a globe. It's not a ball that you would see that happen on because then it would be just passing before you and going back and forth like a zigzag, which is not something that you actually see in creation. But the word for Zethan literally means the hidden region or the uh, marine time land. And it also means to be hidden or concealed, which is what is said of the sun. And if I remember correctly, it also has right here. Zephin, to hide, conceal, to lay hidden or lurk. And it said, Sepanu, right? To set, set of the sun. So to hide and conceal itself is the setting of the sun, which is Zephin, when it goes to the west or from the west to the north. And that's how this word all means these things and what that actually, what that's actually pointing out. But it also means he hid or concealed, treasured, or he laid hidden or lurked. It means to go north, to turn north. And it also means to decode and decipher, because if you can decode this and how the sun hides by going to the north and back to the east, then you've deciphered or decoded how creation actually functions, that we live on a, a planar earth with the luminaries overhead, right? So this was, a, I think this was from 2016. Yeah, there's quite a few posts that I had on this topic when we were going over the stuff, but this is just one of those things. However, I wanted to show that you can find in the common scriptures the same thing you can in the book of Hanok about how the sun functions. It doesn't go into great detail, but it is, it is there. So just one moment, and then we will continue with what we're looking at. All right, shalom again, everyone. This is to cover the last facet of how to keep track of when a year starts. So I know that was a little long, but um, the foundation and the primary sign that we use is to count. And it's based off of the sun and what it's doing throughout the year. If you can keep track of that and you can count 364, you'll always have the repeatable pattern right here this is from a facebook post and i've made we've made a video where we read through this whole thing and i'm also going to link that and the the text there in the description so you, anyone can look at it if they want to or go over but this is a post and it was a uh, put together for another brother in the congregation of elohim where he was asking for why we should not intercalate which basically means why we don't add any days in between the years or like a week between the years to stay in to do whatever this was only going by what's written in throughout the the scriptures throughout the apocryphal writings in the dead sea scrolls and it goes into pretty exhaustive detail about why we should not intercalate so i'm not going to cover all that but i did want to mention a few things that were in here that also ties into when we uh or how we keep track of the year <clears throat> so you saw how the luminary the sun's supposed to work right here in the dead sea scrolls you have five different cycles that are all enumerated that all line up and this is part of how you don't intercalculate the 364 yom or day lunar or solar cycle the three year 354 day lunar cycle which we already covered, you have a full moon on the first day of the year, every third year, All right? Then you have a six year cycle of the Kohen and they all serve in between the sabbatical years, the 49 year Yobelim cycle for the 50th, right? And then a 294 year cycle of six Yobelim that would then repeat. And this is the uh, what Kohen would be serving at that time let me let me show you that real quick all right so right here this is the zadok kohen order or priestly order that was 
this is what's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. In the book of Chronicles or Second Chronicles, I believe, you have the the uh, list of Kohanim that we're going to serve, number 1 through 24 in the order, and that was put down by Dawid. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, you actually have who starts what year, and this cycle, which covers, it starts with number 22 in the order, and then it goes through six Yobelim. You have one right here, two, Oh, it's not gonna not gonna let me scroll like that, huh? Uh, yeah, so it's changing right there. I went to the end. But right here, this is the first set of seven Yobelim. And then you have the next one. It starts with 22, it ends with number one. And then you have, it starts with number two and it ends with number five. Then it starts with number six, ends with number nine, Starts with number 10 and ends with number 13. Starts with number 14 and ends with number 17. Starts with number 18 and ends with number 21. And then it would repeat after this 294 year period. It would start again with number 22 in the order and start this whole list over again. This, this whole pattern is literally written in a conjunction of Gamal in this year at that in this week of years at that time, and then Shekinah, Shek and Yahu at this one. So it would say Gamal in the first week in the second year, and then Shekinah or Shek and Yahu in the fifth week of the set of the first or in the first week of the fifth year. Right. And then it would go through that naming Gamal and Shek and Yahu, Gamal and Shek and Yahu, Gamal and Shek and Yahu as the heads that started these years throughout this entire 294 year period and what it was pointing out was the conjunction of when they served which happened to also be when there was a full moon on the first night of the year every single time and that went through again almost a 300 year period where you don't add any days to the year and you don't add between years like adding a week or a day or three days or whatever you can't do it and stay in line with how this calendar is supposed to function. So <clears throat> the uh, between the lunar cycle right here and the solar cycle of a 364-day year, those are two witnesses that show when the year begins. If you can keep track of when the moon phase is from a three every three-year period, it will be full on the first night of that year. And then you can count your staying online. The third witness for this is in how the seasons function. So if you give me just one moment, we will share that. All right. So between that, the counting of the year and then keeping, keeping in sync with that three-year lunar cycle where the full moon is on the first night of the year. And there's more to it than that. You can actually, they have it written down every single time there's a full moon and a crescent moon throughout the year. You can follow where it has certain amounts of illumination and track it every day throughout the entire year if you wanted to and find out that it actually lines up with what is written in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Brother Jerry Morris has done that with, I think it was the second year in the cycle. And he has a video on that. And I believe our brother Andrew Collins has been tracking that for a few years now where he's been putting down what when the moon is on what parts of the calendar and lining it up with what's actually written as well so that is able to be tracked like that and that's how you can keep in two witnesses to stay on track the third witness you can see right here it says when looking for the new year the key is found in observing the phenomenon he tells us will be in these times equal parts light and dark having the full moon every third year as the sign or oath the moon makes and seeing the signs that accompany each season as shown in Hanok chapter 82. And we haven't gotten there yet in our reading, but we will, okay? Although we have only two of the four seasons expounded on, there might have been more. I believe there was something else written in the Dead Sea Scrolls that had allusions to the other weeks i have to find it but um 
you can see you can see what's manifest during those times and you can actually see when the seasons are based off of what's going on around you everyone knows in the springtime things are blooming the leaves are returning to the trees the grass is growing on the ground flowers are starting to sprout the the life is returning and that's actually a sign that's enumerated at that time if i can find it real quick we'll we'll cover it um this is just different information again this is all here if you want to read um why we should not intercalate this is an excellent excellent resource pretty exhaustive i think i covered every aspect of it that i could think of but we want to get to there's hanok chapter 72 74 and here we go chapter 82 this is just a little bit of it but this is the third witness of how you can tell when the year begins which is the whole point okay and it says and these are the names of the leaders which divide the four seasons of the years which are fixed malkiel hele or hela emelech milio and narel which is the lamp or light of L, right? The names of those who lead, who lead them, right? Who precede them are Adnarul. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce that. La Yasusel, Ilumel. These three follow the leaders of the orders, as well as the four which follow after the three leaders of the orders which follow after those leaders of the stations that divide the four seasons of the year. So I put in a bracket, you have one leader for each season, then three follow each one for the three months in each, then the four leaders at the ends of the seasons. So right here, what it was describing, okay? You have the four leaders that start each season, okay? And they're the head. Then you have the three for the for the beginnings of each month, okay, in each season that are separate from the, the heads of the season, the, the leaders that head the seasons themselves. And then you have the last, the four that are at the signs or the end of season. And those are all the leaders of the luminaries that bring in the year exactly. Okay, so back on track here, to help determine the beginning of the year, this is the significant part that we have to look at here. This is at the beginning, or at the very beginning, Malkiel, whose name is called Tamayin, and the sun rises and rules, and all the days of his authority during which he reigns are 91 days. That's why this one, if you will, is the leader here, and he reigns for 91 days over all of this. And then you have the individual heads of the month leaders, and then you have the, the last leader that leads the end of the day season, right? And you have that for each one. <clears throat> it says, and these are the signs of the days which become manifest during the period of his authority. Sweat, heat, and dryness. All the trees bear fruit, and leaves grow on all trees. Okay? Now, except for the winter trees, right? The ones that bloom and thrive in the, the darkness are withering during this time. But the point is that all the trees that bear fruit will do so. They start growing and blooming, and this is when that happens. There will be a good harvest, rose flowers, right? And all the flowers which grow in the field, but the winter tree shall wither. Okay? So this is what you can look for as the third witness of when a year begins. It's pretty simple. It's not something that we have to you know, be overly cautious about. But when you see all of these things on all trees and universally everywhere around you happening, then you know you're in spring. 
when you conjoin that with the counting of a 364 day year and with the conjunction of the full moon every third year on the first of the night of the year you're going to be on spot with the calendar i have not found anywhere else in any of the writings both common scriptures and apocrypha that tell you what to look for what will be manifest or the witnesses that you use to determine the year there is no writings about how to use a sundial although there are mentions of sundials in scripture there was a sundial found at Qumran and if you remember I believe it was um Hezkiyahu or no 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 might have been Menashe but one of the signs that they saw was having the the shadow turn back 10 degrees on the sundial and that was during the time of Yeshayahu but it was the sign of the of his foretelling going to be true so the fact that they had sundials and used them is scriptural but how to do it we don't have i i can't i can't definitively say well that's what you do to determine a year using a sundial because there is no written instructions to do that we do however have the, the written instructions to number our days to count 364 only and that the moon will be conjoined in a three-year cycle and that this is what will be manifest during this period and between those three you have three witnesses that confirm the matter so i'm willing that helped anyone that might have need of it and if there's any questions that you might have please feel free to ask we, we don't have all the information but we try to help out the best we can you have a wonderful shabbat and we will talk to you next time shabbat shalom and shabbat